graphical analysis, okay? This is going to be the topic that kind of defines all of derivatives and integrals and all of this. So here's how it goes. It's not really word problems like we saw with related rates. It's more just find this, find that, etc., etc. It's kind of the style of this. So graphical analysis, they give you a function x of t equals 4x to the third minus 2x squared minus 4. Okay, and they're going to ask you a bunch of different questions about it. Questions regarding relative extrema. I'm going to explain what all these words in just a minute. Uh, absolute extrema. Mins and maxes, um, concavity, inflection points, increasing slash decreasing, oh yes, and stuff like critical points. Okay. So let's go over what all these words mean. First, let's start with critical points. All right? A critical point is where a function is either zero or undefined, okay? Now, why is that so significant? If a function is continuous and it is positive, that means it can only become negative if it first goes through zero, okay? Or if it's discontinuous, it can only go, go from positive to negative if it's undefined somewhere between these two, okay? That's why if it's zero or undefined, that means the curve has the possibility to change from positive to negative at that point. It has the possibility to. Because I could draw a curve like this, that's zero here, but it doesn't change from positive to negative. But if I draw a curve like this, the only reason that it was able to change from positive to negative is because it first crossed through zero. So critical points identify where it has the capability to change from positive to negative. And so, if you're given a function, you find critical points by setting the function equal to zero. Or setting the denominator of the function equal to zero. Because the when the denominator of the function is zero, that's when you get an undefined. So we're bringing back all this knowledge that we come from pre calc with domain. Whenever the function is not defined, whenever the domain doesn't exist, that could be a crit that is a critical point. Now, critical points are important for an, uh, analyzing these two words, relative extrema, mins, and maxes. An extrema is just the general term for mins and maxes, minimums and maximums. A minimum is an extremum, a maximum is an extremum, singular extremum, plural extrema. Okay, it's just a general wor word that means minimum or maximum. So it, the way you find extrema, like let's say if I'm given uh, this function, x of t equals 4x to the third, uh, yeah, okay, I'm, if I'm given x of t equals x squared, it's gonna look like that. We need to find out where the function's minimum is, okay? So the way we do that is we first we differentiate the function, we find v of t, and, we, and 2x, all right? And we need to look for the critical points of the derivative, all right? The reason for that being at a minimum or a maximum, at a relative minimum or maximum, 
we're paying attention to this word here, relative extrema, relative min or relative maximum, is a hump in the graph, a bump. Something like this that has a horizontal tangent. A relative extrema is defined by a point in the graph that has a horizontal tangent. If you look at cosine, it has m many relative minimums and relative maximums. Each one has a horizontal tangent. Okay? So the reason we're setting the uh, derivative equal to zero is because all relative minimums and maximums have a zero, uh, zero slope tangent line, have a derivative which is zero at that point, okay? But just because the derivative is zero doesn't mean it's a relative maximum or minimum, relative extrema. Take y equals x to the third, for example. Looks like this. We have a horizontal tangent here at the origin, yet it's not a relative minimum or maximum. It just keeps increasing through it. A relative minimum is defined by a function that goes from decreasing to increasing. By contrast, a relative maximum is a function that goes from increasing to decreasing. Cosine. It's increasing here, it's decreasing here, it's increasing here, it's decreasing there. Notice uh, extremas can only happen when the slope changes from increasing to decreasing or decreasing to increasing. A better way of saying that is extrema only happen when the derivative changes from positive to negative. Because a positive derivative indicates an increasing function and a negative derivative correlates to a decreasing function. Okay, so there are two ways to identify relative extrema. And that's with the first derivative test and the second derivative test. Okay, so with the first derivative test for relative extrema. Step one is find the critical points of the derivative. Okay? Remember, critical points are where a function is either zero or undefi undefined. Okay? And relative extrema are places where the graph incurs, the slope of the graph incurs a sign change, where the derivative incurs a sign change, okay? And as we know, things can't change from positive to negative without going through zero first. So step one is to find the critical points, find where it can change from positive to negative. Step two in the first derivative test is we need to make a sign chart. I'm going to show you what a sign chart is for uh, this example. All right, so on a sign chart, on top, you would put your original function, in this case, our original function, x of t, and on the bottom, you would put your derivative, x prime of t, x prime of t. Now, on your sign chart, uh, you would put all of your critical points. In this case, we only have one critical point. If we look at our derivative, we ask the question, when is this zero? When is this undefined? We find one, it's never undefined. Two, it's zero when x equals zero. So, zero. And, remember, our goal is to find out whether our derivative changes sign at this point. So the simple way to do that is to find a number in this section of the sign chart, find a number between zero and negative infinity, that would be this section. Let's try uh, negative 1, for example, okay? And then we'd select a number between 0 and infinity in somewhere in this section of the sign chart. The reason I say that is sometimes you would have multiple critical points and you would then be confined to just this section. But 
in this case, we only have one critical point. So our range is between zero and infinity. Let's tr say positive one, okay? So if we plug in positive one into our derivative, what do we get? We get a positive number. So the derivative is positive on this side. If we plug in negative one to our derivative, what do we get? We get a negative number. And that means that on this interval, to the right of the critical point, the derivative is positive, and on this interval, the entire interval, from negative infinity to zero, the derivative is negative. Therefore, on the same interval, the original function is decreasing, and on this interval, the original function is increasing. Okay? Therefore, we know that this is a relative minimum because of the shape that a graph takes on. First the slope is negative, then the slope is positive. Horizontal tangent occurs down here at the critical point. And if this was negative 2x, for example, these signs would be flipped. This would be an increasing to decreasing. And this would be a relative maximum. You see how first the slope is positive, then the slope is negative. All right, now on to the second derivative test, okay? So if you're looking to find relative extrema, again, you're looking for a change in sign of the derivative. Okay, so step one is the same step one, okay? In order to have a change in sign, we must have a critical point. In order to have a change in sign, the function must either equal zero or must be undefined. So in order for the derivative to change sign, the derivative must have a critical point at which the slope of the original function, because that's what the derivative represents, the slope of the original function changes from a negative slope to a positive slope or from a positive slope to a negative slope. Okay? So same step one. Step two is different. Okay? Step two is find the second derivative of your function. Now, step three is where things might get a little confusing, because step three is a bit counterintuitive. If you have a critical point, if you have a critical point, and the second derivative, we're going to say if f double prime of x is positive, then you have a relative minimum, and if f double prime of x is negative, then you have a relative maximum. If f double prime of x is zero, then the second derivative test is inconclusive, and you're going to have to use the first derivative test instead. Okay? If you want my advice, I'd recommend using the first derivative test all the time so that you'll never need to waste your time doing this, only to find out it's inconclusive. But there are some multiple choice problems that will require you to use the second derivative test, and 20% of the time there's one part on one FRQ that will explicitly tell you use the second derivative test for this and that. Now first let me explain to you why this is the way it is, because it seems counterintuitive. If the second derivative is positive, that means the first derivative is increasing. Makes sense. If the first derivative is increasing, remember the first derivative, f prime x, is the slope of f of x. So if f prime of x is increasing, that means the slope of f of x is increasing. Okay? So what does that look like? An increasing slope looks like this. The slope is negative here, and the slope is positive here. The slope increased from negative to positive. Okay, therefore, a positive second derivative, an increasing slope, determines a relative minimum. And a decreasing slope, a slope that starts out negative, excuse me, starts out positive and ends up negative, we decrease from positive to negative, that's a relative maximum. Okay? 
So those are your first and second derivative tests. Those are relative extrema. We call them relative extrema, relative minimums and maximums, because uh, you can have a function that looks like this. Where this right here is a relative maximum, even though there's a bigger maximum, a bigger y value up here. Okay? This is a relative maximum simply because it is a hump in the graph. All right? That's why we call it relative. In the relative surrounding area, it's a maximum. We're going to cover absolute maximums in just a little bit, so at the end of this topic. Okay. So, we covered increasing, decreasing, we covered critical points, we covered min's max, we covered relative extrema, absolute extrema, I just talked about that. Now, let's talk about these three things. Concavity, inflection points, and inflection points. Excuse me, these two things. So what are those two words, okay? Everything we just talked about, things like relative extrema, min's max, critical points, those all have to deal with the first derivative. They all have to deal with f prime x. These two words, concavity and flexion points, are all have to do with the second derivative, f double prime x, okay? So I give you a function. All right, best example is always f of x equals x squared. All right, and concavity is our measure of whether something is concave up or concave down, okay? Concave up, concave down, okay? Now, what exactly does that mean? Well, mathematically, a concave up function is a function whose second derivative is positive at a particular point, okay? You can be your concave up on an interval, the same way how you are increasing, decreasing on an interval. And a concave down function is where f double prime of x is negative on an interval. If it will look graphically, a concave up function looks like a valley. That's concave up. A more rigorous definition of what concave up means is that the <clears throat> function's slope is increasing, like we just covered in the second derivative test. A positive second derivative indicates an increasing slope. <clears throat> slope, or anything else for that matter, cannot be increasing at a point, it needs to be increasing on an interval. So you can see here, because we x squared is concave up, as I demonstrated for you here, if we take x double prime of t, we get it's 2. That's always a positive number, therefore x squared is concave up on the entire domain, the slope of x squared is increasing on the entire domain. You see we have a negative slope here and we increase to a positive slope and that positive slope becomes steeper and steeper and steeper as you go on to the right of the graph. Okay? A concave down function would look like negative x squared because boom, boom, boom. Now it's always negative, but you can have functions with higher degrees that look like this, where it's concave down for one portion and concave up for a different portion. Like I said before, it will be concave down on some interval and concave up on another interval. That brings us to inflection points. An inflection point is, where, is the point where something changes from concave up to concave down, or concave down to concave up, okay? So you find inflection points in this manner right here. You find inflection points by drawing a sign chart, 
on the top, this time you have f prime x, and this time on the bottom you have double prime x. And you find, you do step one, you find the critical points of the derivative. In this case, our original is f prime of x, and our derivative is f double prime x. So you find the critical points of the thing on the bottom. In the case of x squared, there's no critical points. Therefore, there's no inflection points for x squared. And if you see on the graph of x squared, there's no place where it changes from concave up to concave down. However, if I give you something different, like let's say this function, it looks like it has uh, an inflection point at about negative 1. So let's put that on our chart. And it would be the same process as the first derivative test. You plug something in on this interval, you plug something in on that interval. If you get a negative number here, you get a positive number here. That would indicate decreasing, increasing, and if the slope is decreasing, we're concave down, commonly abbreviated as conch down. If the slope is increasing, we're conch up. Okay, so that's pretty much everything on graphical analysis. Graphical analysis is probably the most tedious thing. It's probably the thing you're going to need a good amount of practice with. It seems simple at first to some people, but it's one of those things where there's a lot of room for error, and therefore it's one of those things where you uh, need a lot of practice. It's one of those things that's easy to watch, it's easy to follow along, but it's much more difficult to do in practice. So this uh, graphical analysis, that's what this subtopic is called, and related rates, along with uh, the next topic we're gonna go over, it's a topic called optimization will probably have, gonna have to be what you devote the most practice time out of anything to. But we're gonna finish out graphical analysis with our last topic, absolute extrema, which is what I <coughs> referenced here. Absolute extrema are what is the maximum y value that the graph ever achieves on a given interval. Okay? The reason I say on a given interval is because if you take something like y equals x squared, there is no maximum maximum value. The graph diverges to infinity. So you need to have an interval to bound what the maximum value can be. <sighs> now, we have a theorem for this. You know, you needed to memorize the IVT, the intermediate value theorem. You needed to memorize the MVT, the mean value theorem. This is the extreme value theorem, the EVT. This is not something you need to memorize, but it's just a good starting point for us to introduce this concept of absolute extrema. Okay, so the EVT, extreme value theorem, states that on any closed interval A comma B, from A to B, a function must achieve each a maximum, a global maximum value and a global minimum value at least once. At least once. Okay? So, when you're given a problem with um, absolute or global extrema, absolute or global maximum or minimum, it would general, it's generally an outright question, like what is the maximum value that this function obtains, okay? So there are certain example of, examples of that. There you could have a function like this, which achieves its global minimum here, at the beginning of the interval, point A, and it achieves its maximum point here, at the end of the interval, point B, you could have 
function like this, which achieves its global minimum at a relative minimum, like we went over here, and it achieves its global maximum twice at the endpoints, and you can have the inverse of that, where it achieves a global maximum once at a relative maximum, and it achieves a relative minimum twice at the endpoints. And there are many other examples, but these were just to give you a sort of an introduction. The way you would go about solving a problem like this is you would go through all the steps here to identify where you have relative maxes and relative minimums. And you would do a little chart, okay? Let's say the question is you're given f of x equals x to the third minus 2x, okay? And you are asked to find the absolute maximum value of the function from 0 to 4, closed interval. What you would do is you make a chart. On that chart you put your endpoints, 0, 4, and you leave a little room for uh, any horizontal tangents that you may find. Again, horizontal tangents are indicative of a relative minimum or relative maximum. But since we're only interested in relative maximums for this question, we only need to worry about that type of sign change. Okay, so why don't we find the relative maximums of this thing? So if we take the derivative, f prime x equals 3x squared minus 2, and we find where that equals 0, uh, that would be at, bear with me, x equals plus minus rad 2 over 3. Now, we're given in the interval 0 to 4. The negative rad 2 over 3 is not in our interval, so we can eliminate that component. Now we're just left with the plus 2 over 3. Now, we need to identify whether this is a relative maximum or a relative minimum, or neither. Because you could have a scenario where there is no sign change, in which case you don't have a relative extremum. So, my, I prefer to do the second derivative test. Let me take the second derivative. f double prime x equals 6x. Okay, x is red 2 over 3. f double prime x is therefore positive. Therefore, we have a relative minimum here. So, this is irrelevant. Therefore, the only two values we have to worry about are our endpoints. Now, what we do next is this side is our x, this is our f of x, and we say f of 0 is 0, f of 4 is 54, 56, excuse me. And we see that the function's absolute maximum value is achieved at y equals 4. Okay? Now, if this was a relative maximum, then we would have to include it here, and we would have to do the same thing that we just did with the others. We'd have to plug it into our function, and we'd have to see what value it came out to as. And once you plug in all of the x values into your f of x, you just look at which one's the highest, and that's your absolute maximum, or you look at which one's the lowest, and that's your absolute minimum. Pretty straightforward. Now is going to be probably one of the harder topics. Like, this might be slightly harder than related rates, if you guys have done any practice with related rates yet. So, um, let me just erase my right board real quick. A lot of calculus students' least favorite topic. Luckily for you, it's my favorite. So you know you're going to be getting a good little lecture here. Okay. So what is optimization? Optimization is a related rates problem. It's a specific type of related rates problem where you're trying to maximize something. You're trying to maximize a gain or you're trying to minimize a loss. Okay? 
you're never going to try and do both because then you're trying to solve for two variables and you can't solve that type of problem. You'll be given one variable and that variable is either going to represent uh, reward or uh, loss and you'll do the respective calculation based on each, okay? So the very common type of optimization problem is an example I'm going to use to introduce you guys to this topic. It's going to be an optimization problem involving a rectangle. And this rectangle, it's almost never, they're almost never going to tell you it's a rectangle. You're going to have to interpret that from the scenario. They're going to say like a pig pen or uh, the square area of a room. And you're just going to have to interpret that as a rectangle. Okay? Just like related rates, they're all scenarios. They're all word problems. And you're going to have to interpret the situation to understand what to do next. Okay? So, a very common uh, optimization problem, because it's so easy, it usually shows up on a multiple choice, is... Uh, a farmer has 32 feet of fence. What is the maximum area he is able to enclose with that fence? Okay? So just like in related rates, you're going to need to come up with equations to represent your variables. In this case, it's a rectangle, and we are looking for maximum area, so we need the area of a rectangle, A equals length times width, and we're given 32 feet of fence. We're given a perimeter. We're given 32 equals 2L plus 2W. Okay. So, what we're going to need to do here is we're going to need to solve out for one of our variables, okay? The way we're going to do that is, how about we divide both sides by 2? 16 equals L plus W, and now we can say W equals 16 minus L. Put one variable in terms of another. So that now I can go to my area equation and I can say A equals length times width, which is equal to 16 minus length. Let me do this so you don't confuse these with the number 1. Okay, so now what do we go from here? Well, we're trying to find when do we have a maximum area. If you remember last unit, we taught you how to cover ma how to find maximums. We take the derivative and we set it equal to zero. dA dt equals whatever this derivative is. We'll figure that out shortly. And we're looking for when the derivative is zero. Okay? So, we're going to set it equal to zero, and we're going to try and find the derivative of this guy. So, what I'm going to do here is I'm going to distribute out the L so that I can avoid doing a uh, product rule. See, that makes my life a whole lot easier now that I just did that. Which equals 16 minus 2L equals zero. And we're now C2L equals 16, L equals 8. All right? So your steps are find equations that can represent all of the variables you're given and all of the variables you want to find. Isolate the variable. By isolating a variable, combine your equations into a single equation or by isolating a variable, put one of your equations in terms of only two variables. That's the 
That's the hardest part of all optimization problems. Finding an equation that is only going to be in terms of two variables. Because if it's in terms of two variables, then you can differentiate it. And here, it's just a simple differentiation from there. We solve for L, and it's asking us from the maximum area. So we take our L, uh, we plug it back into this equation, W equals 16 minus L, W equals 8, area equals L times W, area equals 64. Another nuance of optimization problems that's mirrored directly out of related rates, always include your units! Yay! Who remembers that? I lost so many points doing that. Ha! <sighs> Dark days. Remember your units, guys. Um, was this? Meters squared. Correct units, by the way. Dark days, indeed. Okay. So, optimization is... One, chi one tip I will tell you, usually with relative extrema that we did in the previous unit, in the previous topic, uh, you'd have to do a whole sign chart to identify whether it was a relative maximum or a relative minimum. It wasn't enough just to find where the derivative equals zero. Here, you're never going to need to do a sign chart. You can always just set the derivative equal to zero. Okay? Because it will always work out such that if you're looking for a maximum, wherever the derivative is zero is a relative maximum in whatever optimization problem you're given. Okay? So, let me give you uh, the converse of this. Just like related rates, optimization is going to take many, many forms. Um, I can only show you the basics here. I can only teach you the ropes. I can't show you every problem. The only way to get good at optimization is to see more problems and practice more problems on Khan Academy. And I know like the super advanced ones can be really difficult. That's why I have a Discord server. That's why I invite you guys on, message me, DM me, set up a voice chat with me. I will answer your questions. I'm here for extra help. Okay, don't worry about it. If you run into any uh, questions you can't solve on Khan Academy, I can help you. But with the little time we do have left, let me do another optimization example just to show you guys. This time it's going to be a similar one, except this time we were maximizing a benefit. Now I'm going to give you a problem reducing a loss. A farmer dot 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 wants. 64 uh, square meters. Oh wait, this is supposed to be feet. You see, I, ma I made the mistake again! It's supposed to be feet squared. Ah, 64 square feet of area. Uh, what finds the minimum fence he must use in order to achieve this. Da, da, da. Yeah, you get it. <sighs> okay, you set up your two equations. You want 64 square feet of area, 64 equals length times width. And we're looking for minimum fence, minimum perimeter. P equals 2L plus 2W. Try and find one equation that we can put in terms of only two variables. Um, we've got something like that here. We can divide both sides by W and we can say L equals 64 over W. And we can sub that back in here and we can say P equals 128 over W plus 2W. Um, dp dt equals the derivative of this would be negative 128 over w squared plus 2 and dp dt the derivative set it equal to 0 
equals negative 128 over w squared plus 2. Then we do some algebraic manipulation there. Solve for w. And once we solve for w, you plug it back into your perimeter equation. Oh, sorry, you plug it back into length to solve for length. And once you've got length and width, you can plug it into perimeter equation. And that will give you your minimum perimeter, your minimum fence. And if you want to try and solve the rest of the problem on your own, the minimum fence is, if I remember correctly, Thirty-two meters. No feet. I always mess up the units. Don't be like me. Be like me, but don't mess up your units. <laughs>